The Skylight Room by O. Henry. First, Mrs. Parker would show you the double parlors. You would not dare to interrupt her description of their advantages and of the merits of the gentlemen who had occupied them for eight years. Then you would manage to stammer forth the confession that you were neither a doctor nor a dentist. Mrs. Parker's manner of receiving the admission was such that you could never afterward entertain the same feeling toward your parents, who had neglected to train you up in one of the professions that fitted Mrs. Parker's parlors. Next, you ascended one flight of stairs and looked at the second floor back at eight dollars, convinced by her second floor manner. That it was worth the twelve dollars that Mr. Tusenberry always paid for it until he left to take charge of his brother's orange plantation in Florida near Palm Beach, where Mrs. McIntyre always spent the winters that had the double front room with a private bath. You managed to babble that you wanted something still cheaper. If you survived Mrs. Parker's scorn, You were taken to look at Mr. Skidder's large hall room on the third floor. Mr. Skidder's room was not vacant. He wrote plays and smoked cigarettes in it all day long. But every room hunter was made to visit his room to admire the lambrequins. After each visit, Mr. Skidder, from the fright caused by possible eviction, would pay something on his rent. Then, oh, then, if you still stood on one foot, with your hot hand clutching the three moist dollars in your pocket, and hoarsely proclaimed your hideous and culpable poverty, never more would Mrs. Parker be cicerone of yours. She would honk loudly the word Clara. She would show you her back and march downstairs. Then Clara, the colored maid. Would escort you up the carpeted ladder that served for the fourth flight, and show you the skylight room. It occupied seven by eight feet of floor space at the middle of the hall. On each side of it was a dark lumber closet or storeroom. In it was an iron cot, a washstand, and a chair. A shelf was the dresser. Its four bare walls seemed to close in upon you like the sides of a coffin. Your hand crept to your throat. You gasped. You looked up as from a well, and breathed once more. Through the glass of the little skylight, you saw a square of blue infinity. Two dollars, sir," Clara would say in her half contemptuous, half Tuscanian tones. One day. Miss Leeson came hunting for a room. She carried a typewriter made to be lugged around by a much larger lady. She was a very little girl, with eyes and hair that had kept on growing after she had stopped, and that always looked as if they were saying, "Goodness me, why didn't you keep up with us?" Mrs. Parker showed her the double parlors. In this closet, she said. One could keep a skeleton, or an anesthetic, or coal. But I am neither a doctor nor a dentist," said Miss Leeson with a shiver. Mrs. Parker gave her the incredulous, pitying, sneering, icy stare that she kept for those who failed to qualify as doctors or dentists, and led the way to the second floor back. Eight dollars," said Miss Leeson. "Dear me." I'm not heady. If I do look green, I'm just a poor little working girl. Show me something higher and lower. Mister Skidder jumped, and strewed the floor with cigarette stubs at the rap on his door. Excuse me, Mister Skidder," said Missus Parker, with her demon smile at his pale looks. "I didn't know you were in here." I asked the lady to have a look at your lambrequins. They're too lovely for anything," said Miss Leeson, 
smiling in exactly the way angels do. After they had gone, Mr. Skidder got very busy erasing the tall, black-haired heroine from his latest, unproduced play, and inserting a small, roguish one with heavy, bright hair and vivacious features. Anna, how'd old jump at it, said Mr. Skidder to himself, putting his feet up against the lambrequins and disappearing in a cloud of smoke like an aerial cuttlefish. Presently, the toxin call of Clara sounded to the world the state of Miss Leeson's purse. A dark goblin seized her, mounted a Stygian stairway, thrust her into a vault with a glimmer of light in its top, and muttered the menacing and cabalistic words, Two dollars. I'll take it, sighed Miss Leeson, sinking down upon the squeaky iron bed. Every day, Miss Leeson went out to work. At night, she brought home papers with handwriting on them and made copies with her typewriter. Sometimes she had no work at night, and then she would sit on the steps of the high stoop with the other rumors. Miss Leeson was not intended for a skylight room when the plans were drawn for her creation. She was gay-hearted and full of tender, whimsical fancies. Once she let Mr. Skidder read to her three acts of his great, unpublished comedy, It's No Kid, or The Heir of the Subway. There was rejoicing among the gentlemen rumors whenever Miss Leeson had time to sit on the steps for an hour or two, but Miss Longnecker, the tall blonde who taught in a public school, and said, Well, really? To everything you said, sat on the top step and sniffed, and Miss Dorn, who shot at the moving ducks at Coney every Sunday and worked in a department store, sat on the bottom step and sniffed. Miss Leeson sat on the middle step, and the men would quickly group around her. Especially Mr. Skidder, who had cast her in his mind for the star part in a private, romantic, unspoken drama in real life. And especially Mr. Hoover, who was 45, fat, flush, and foolish. And especially very young Mr. Evans, who set up a hollow cough to induce her to ask him to leave off cigarettes. The men voted her the funniest and jolliest ever, but the sniffs on the top step and the lower step were implacable. I pray you let the drama halt while Chorus stalks to the footlights and drops an obsidian tear upon the fatness of Mr. Hoover. Tune the pipes to the tragedy of tallow, the bane of bulk, the calamity of corpulence. Tried out, Falstaff might have rendered more romance to the ton than would have Romeo's rickety ribs to the ounce. A lover may sigh, but he must not puff. To the train of Momus are the fat men remanded. In vain beats the faithfulest heart above a 52-inch belt. Avant, Hoover. Hoover, 45, flush, and foolish, might carry off Helen herself. Hoover, 45, flush, foolish, and fat, is meat for perdition. There was never a chance for you, Hoover. As Mrs. Parker's rumors sat thus one summer's evening, Miss Leeson looked up into the firmament and cried with her little gay laugh, Why, there's Billy Jackson. I can see him from down here, too. All looked up, some at the windows of skyscrapers, some casting about for an airship. Jackson guided. It's that star, explained Miss Leeson, pointing with a tiny finger. Not the big one that twinkles, the steady blue one near it. I can see it every night through my skylight. I named it Billy Jackson. Well, really, said Miss Longnecker. 
I didn't know you were an astronomer, Miss Leeson. Oh, yes, said the small stargazer. I know as much as any of them about the style of sleeves they're going to wear next fall in Mars. Well, really, said Miss Longnecker, the star you refer to as Gamma, of the constellation Cassiopeia. It is nearly of the second magnitude, and its meridian passage is, oh, said the very young Mr. Evans, I think Billy Jackson is a much better name for it. Same here, said Mr. Hoover, loudly breathing defiance to Miss Longnecker. I think Miss Leeson has just as much right to name stars as any of those old astrologers had. Well, really, said Miss Longnecker. I wonder whether it's a shooting star, remarked Miss Dorn. I hit nine ducks and a rabbit out of ten in the gallery at Coney Sunday. He doesn't show up very well from down here, said Miss Leeson. You ought to see him from my room. You know you can see stars even in the daytime from the bottom of a well. At night, my room is like the shaft of a coal mine, and it makes Billy Jackson look like the big diamond pin that night fastens her kimono with. There came a time after that when Miss Leeson brought no formable paper home to copy, and when she went out in the morning, instead of working, she went from office to office and let her heart felt away in the drip of cold refusals transmitted through insolent office boys. This went on. There came an evening when she wearily climbed Mrs. Parker's stoop at the hour when she always returned from her dinner at the restaurant, but she had had no dinner. As she stepped into the hall, Mr. Hoover met her and seized his chance. He asked her to marry him, and his fatness hovered above her like an avalanche. She dodged and caught the balustrade. He tried for her hand, and she raised it and smote him weakly in the face. Step by step she went up, dragging herself by the railing. She passed Mr. Skidder's door as he was red-inking a stage direction for Myrtle DeLorme, Miss Leeson, in his unexpected comedy, to pirouette across stage from L to the side of the Count. Up the carpeted ladder she crawled at last and opened the door of the skylight room. She was too weak to light the lamp or to undress, she fell upon the iron cot, her fragile body scarcely hollowing the worn springs, and in that erebus of the skylight room she slowly raised her heavy eyelids and smiled. For Billy Jackson was shining down on her, calm and bright and constant through the skylight. There was no world about her. She was sunk in a pit of blackness, with but that small square of pallid light framing the star that she had so whimsically and oh so ineffectually named. Miss Longnecker must be right. It was Gamma, of the constellation Cassiopeia, and not Billy Jackson, and yet she could not let it be Gamma. As she lay on her back, she tried twice to raise her arm. The third time, she got two thin fingers to her lips and blew a kiss out of the black pit to Billy Jackson. Her arm fell back limply. Goodbye, Billy, she murmured faintly. You're millions of miles away, and you won't even twinkle once. But you kept where I could see you most of the time up there when there wasn't anything else but darkness to look at, didn't you? Millions of miles. Goodbye, Billy Jackson. Clara, the colored maid, found the door locked at ten the next day, and they forced it open, vinegar and the slapping of wrist, and burnt feathers proving of no avail. Someone ran to phone for an ambulance. In due time, it backed up to the door with much gong clanging and the capable young medico in his white linen coat, ready, active, confident with his smooth face, half debonair, half grim, danced up the steps. Ambulance call to 49, he said briefly. What's the trouble? 
Oh, yes, doctor, sniffed Mrs. Parker, as though her trouble, that there should be trouble in the house, was the greater. I can't think what can be the matter with her. Nothing we can do would bring her to. It's a young woman, a Miss Elsie. Yes, a Miss Elsie Leeson, never before in my house. What room? cried the doctor in a terrible voice, to which Mrs. Parker was a stranger. The skylight room, it... Evidently, the ambulance doctor was familiar with the location of skylight rooms. He was gone up the stairs four at a time. Mrs. Parker followed slowly, as her dignity demanded. On the first landing, she met him coming back, bearing the astronomer in his arms. He stopped and let loose the practiced scalpel of his tongue, not loudly. Gradually, Mrs. Parker crumbled as a stiff garment that slips down from a nail. Ever afterward, there remained crumbles in her mind and body. Sometimes her curious rumors would ask her what the doctor said to her. Let that be, she would answer. If I can get forgiveness for having heard it, I will be satisfied. The ambulance physician strode with his burden through the pack of hounds that follow the curiosity chase, and even they fell back along the sidewalk abashed, for his face was that of one who bears his own dead. They noticed that he did not lay down upon the bed prepared for it in the ambulance the form that he carried, and all that he said was, and all he said was, Drive like hell, Wilson, to the driver. That is all. Is it a story? In the next morning's paper, I saw a little news item, and the last sentence of it may help you, as it helped me, to weld the incidents together. It recounted the reception into Bellevue Hospital of a young woman who had been removed from number 49 East Street, suffering from debility induced by starvation. It concluded with these words, Dr. William Jackson, the ambulance physician who attended the case, says the patient will recover, will recover.